All right, welcome into a special playoff version of the Aftershock. I am here with the play-by-play -play voice of Sporting Kansas City, Kansas City, uh, Allie Trost Martin. Allie, how are you doing? I am excellent. So excited uh, for this playoff match, and what a season it has been for Sporting Kansas City! My gosh, oh, wow. um, yeah. from winless in the first ten to a uh, hot summer getting back on the right track. And now thanks to decision day and a win and some stuff going sporting's way they're in the playoffs. It, it's felt pretty surreal, but really, really excited to see what this group can do in the postseason. So yeah, doing well. Can't complain. Correct me if I'm wrong. Sporting Kansas city was not over the playoff line at any point in the season until the final day. Is that correct? They had creeped above it, I want to say, only twice okay. prior, but it was only briefly. I want to say there was one night, one match day where they came up over the line and then another result later on in the night pushed them right back down. So they spent very, very little time above the playoff line. But as you saw, the Western Conference was crazy this year. Nobody wanted to clinch a playoff spot. Right. Um, <laughs> and fortunately for sporting, that kept them – in the mix up all the way until decision day and not only getting into the playoffs, but even clinching that eight seed, which now gives them home field advantage against San Jose. So pretty incredible how it all worked out thanks to the expanded playoff format and the fact that the West just really had a lot of movement this year. It was really close even between second, third place and all the way down to 10th and 11th, which is pretty wild. We, you know, we see that there's a lot of parody in major league soccer, but this had to have been one of the craziest years in one conference that I've seen in a long time. Yeah, and I want to get into all that. But first, I want the audience to get to know you a little bit. I would like to get to know you a little bit. We've been following each other on that X Twitter, whatever it is these days, uh, <laughs> for, for a bit. And I've been really watching how your career has transformed. So not only are have you gone from a sideline reporter to a play-by-play -play voice for the team, but then with you know, Apple TV, things got all shaken up, but you also took on uh, now CBS Sports Network. You're part of the Galazzo Network, you know, family over there. Talk about like the amount of change. And you got married, by the way, but uh, <laughs> all, all this change that's happened to you really uh, in the last year, uh, kind of starting with uh, this transformation into Apple TV and how that, you know, maybe led to some other things for you personally. Yeah, it's crazy, right? How you know, one door closes or things change and it can bring about a lot of anxiety or, or worry. You know, what does this mean for me? And, and honestly, working as part of the Sporting KC local TV broadcast was very much a dream job when I got the role back in 2021. When I graduated from college and moved to Kansas City, um, I wanted to get into sports really bad. I had studied journalism at Mizzou, but I had a bulk of my experience in college was doing advertising, marketing, copywriting and stuff. So strangely enough, my first job out of school was actually full time working in branding and advertising. And I was doing the sports thing on the side. And really my North Star coming out of school and being in Kansas City was to break in and get on the Sporting KC broadcast team. And so for me to to have you know, hit that goal was was such a big deal for me. It meant so much. And really, I, I learned so much, got to work with some of the absolute best in the business, from my broadcast colleagues, Nate Bucati and Jacob Peterson, to our production team in the truck, Todd Kinsey, Brad Martell. I learned so much from that group. We had such a blast together, which is why when the news came that everything was going to Apple TV and they were doing away with the local TV broadcast. It was, it was really hard on all of us. Now, number one, right. there was all the uncertainty. What does this mean for me individually in my career? But also this is really going to change how fans interact with their teams and, and is taking away something that meant so much to all of us. And I think each one of us would say uh, in different ways that, that we got to work jobs that were a dream come true for us. So yeah, you know, it, the, the couple months where I was, I would say, like in limbo, you know, coming out of of last year um, and then coming into this season, Nate had um, kind of found out that he was going to be a part of the Apple TV Fox broadcast picture. And he was, if not, going to come back and do the play by play for the radio for Sporting Kansas City. 
And I was just going to come on as, you know, a home game sideline reporter, kind of staying in my same role, but just on radio. So when Nate's schedule got really filled up with all these national opportunities, Sporting KC was like, hey, we know that you've done some play by play. How, how would you feel about doing that role for us being the voice of Sporting Kansas City, which, you know, was not something that I had ever really fully saw myself doing, uh, if I'm being completely honest. But I think for me, my love for Sporting KC and my knowledge of the club, my relationships and my desire to keep pushing myself in my career um, really was kind of giving me the the urge to just say yes and, and take on that opportunity. So really glad that I um, I took that leap. I've learned so much doing play by play, but not just doing play by play, doing it on the radio, which is a completely different animal. Um, so I've learned so much and have really enjoyed it and, and have gotten the chance to now do it during a season that has been um, you know, full, of, it's had a little bit of everything for Sporting KC. And then earlier this summer, I got a chance to uh, go up to Stamford, Connecticut and get on some shows with Galazzo. And now I'm going to be working with them uh, in a continued capacity. So I'm really, really excited about that. I think what they're doing um, and investing in for the sport that we all love and quite frankly, just haven't had, um, you know, a place to go to for complete, comprehensive, consistent coverage, not just here domestically, but even you know worldwide. Uh, it's really special. It's a great group of people. And because the soccer community is, is small and tight in a lot of ways, a lot of the people that I get a chance to work with now in front of the camera or behind the scenes are people that I've either crossed paths with at different parts in my career or have, you know, heard of and never got a chance to fully work together. We work together on a one-off, you know, kind of game or, or broadcast. So that's been really special. And um, yeah, I just, I feel really, really fortunate to get to work in a role that allows me to grow and challenge myself, but also cover the sport that I absolutely love with my whole heart. So uh, yeah, it's, it's been, it's been really fun and it's been a crazy year. Like you said, I also got married. My husband and I bought a house. So uh Things are, are wild, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah, it's it's it seems like it's been a great ride, and congratulations on the expanded relationship with uh, CBS Sports Network. And that's not the end of it, because you've also been involved with the KC Current. I know you like to do a lot of uh, local uh, charity events and things that allow you to give back to the community there. And NWSL is coming to the Bay Area, so a lot of the people watching this are very excited to finally have an NWSL team in the Bay Area. And if I could draw a quick little parallel here, uh, Danielle Slayton, who's one of the owners of Bay FC, she began on, with the earthquakes as a sideline reporter. Obviously, she's got a soccer background before that, but you know, she began a, a, with that. She's now also on Apple TV. And and your voice comes through Apple TV because you're the radio voice. So 17 games a season, yeah. you know, your fans have the option to hear your voice instead of the national announcers. But, uh, you know, she's now part of that. She's also in, you know, involved with NWSL. So, you know, there are some kind of parallels there. Um, Kate Scott, by the way, who's a, you know, national uh, 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 person who covers like, uh, like, you know, she covered the, the recent Women's World Cup. She does the 76ers play by play. She does wow. all kinds of stuff. She was an earthquake sideline reporter. So there's something about women sideline reporters in MLS who are just really killing it these days. <laughs> um, but talk to me a little bit about, you know, Casey Current and kind of you got a, you got the first uh, women's soccer stadium just for women mm -hmm. being built in Kansas City right now. It's coming together. It's almost there. They just announced a sponsor. You know, give us just a little bit about, you know, how NWSL is going in Kansas City these days. Yeah, I, I mean, the response has been incredible. And it's not the first go uh, for an NWSL team in Kansas City. FC Casey um, had been uh, in Kansas City since the, the beginning of the NWSL uh, back in 2013 when the league formed. Um, but then that team didn't work out, different, you know, ownership group, different things like that. And that team eventually went to Utah. Um, but then with things that happened in Utah over the last couple of years, the team was kind of in a position where it was up for grabs and, and a new ownership group in Kansas City emerged and had a, a really ambitious plan to make women's soccer in Kansas City, women's professional soccer, 
make it a, a, a huge deal here, not just as something, hey, we're going to add this as part of our portfolio and just kind of, you know, do the bare minimum. No, they want to make this a, as big of a deal as they possibly can. And they absolutely have. Um, they've been breaking records, the Kansas City Current, with their attendance um, at, at matches at Children's Mercy Park, the soccer specific stadium they've built, I believe will hold close to 12,000. I don't think that's an exact, I want to say it's like somewhere in the 11,000 range, but it has the capacity to expand beyond that to help keep up with the growing interest and, and just fan support of women's soccer. We've seen the, the current have crowds even larger than what their stadium is, is slated to hold. But it's all about creating that atmosphere, right? It's all about making this an experience that feels so exciting and comparable to what we see in, in other professional sports that have been around for a long time. And, and I think what's interesting with the women's soccer space is that there have been past failed leagues before the NWSL. And the NWSL is now only 10 years old. Like it's kind of crazy to think with how big women's soccer has been since you go all the way back to, you know, the, the world cup teams of the late nineties and, and how soccer really has continued to grow for, for women and, and young girls. I grew up as like an early two thousands kid and, and soccer was like everything to me. So the fact that in the professional space, it's, it's kind of taken this long for it to start hitting some of these milestones is kind of mind boggling, but it's also taken the right people to bring forward that investment. And so a huge credit to Chris and Angie Long, to Brittany Mahomes and Patrick Mahomes and their willingness to not just bring a, a team to Kansas City, but to bring a team to Kansas City and put this city and the NWSL on the map in an even bigger way by investing in the facilities, bringing the first women's uh, soccer specific stadium to the league and, and to the sport. And it's what this this league has has kind of needed for a long time and they're they're reaping the rewards as well i just saw uh you know reports recently that the current are one of the highest earning revenue teams in the entire nwsl so you know you got to spend money to make money a little bit and they've done uh exactly yeah. that so it's been really really cool to see and i think it's only just the beginning of of what is to come but it's it's setting the tone now for future ownership groups it's like hey if you're coming into the league it's not just about buying a team and and running a team how what plans do you have to grow the sport to do things that help keep up and keep this upward trajectory going upwards at the rate that it is right now because it's taken ownership groups like we've seen with angel city the san diego wave the kansas city current that are newer teams to this league within the last couple of years but are doing things that are helping grow the league at a much faster rate than some of the original teams that you know, maybe had come in at a different time. Yeah, it's really exciting. And there's just nothing else going on in, in sports world in Kansas City right now. <laughs> nothing, nothing at all. Kansas City is, uh, is know, having its my, moment right now. That is for sure. My, my daughter would uh, be very upset at me if I didn't at least ask you something about Taylor. So what has been having her in Kansas City at some of these Chiefs games? What has that done with in terms of the city and the old, the sports talk and everything that goes on around that. Just give us a little taste. I, I mean, I, it's it's kind of wild. I, you see like all these like little shops around town now have all of this like Taylor Swift uh, inspired Chiefs gear and everything. And while I will say that it's definitely evoked like a very, you know, big response from people in Kansas City, there is this kind of mindset in Kansas City. And I didn't know this until I, I'm not from here originally. Um, but there is so much pride that Kansas Cityans have for Kansas City. It's like the only city that you will go to where people are wearing hats that say KC or like have a big heart with the KC in it. Like people rock Kansas City gear just in their own backyards, going on a walk, going out to the grocery store. People love living in Kansas City. And I think when you couple that now with the success that this city has had on a, on a much larger scale, when you look at the NFL, for example, when you look at the fact that this city was recently awarded uh, a World Cup bid as well, I think it's kind of this feeling of, hey, now the rest of the world is starting to see what makes Kansas City so great. And I think the other thing too is while, yes, Taylor Swift being here and her relationship with Travis Kelsey has certainly been a uh, big talking point across the NFL and, and has certainly been an exciting thing here in Kansas City. 
people in Kansas City give people their space. You know, it, it's not like you're going to deal with paparazzi waiting outside of a restaurant or anything like that. And all of the pictures that you've seen, like fans capture, like the worst quality images, like zoomed in from your phone and stuff. So it's not like, you know, I think people are excited about it, but it's not like anyone's going to risk doing something dumb or, or to make Travis Kelsey feel uncomfortable or anything like that. But it, it's definitely been cool. And I think, you know, for me, Kansas City is a hidden gem in so many ways. It's a wonderful city. It has so much to offer and it's not just a flyover state. It's it's certainly been developing and growing in a lot of ways, even since I've been here. The food scene's fantastic. The art scene is amazing. The sports are great. Some great concerts and shows come here as well. And there's some great neighborhoods to live in. So um, it's awesome. If Taylor wants to stick around, we're happy to have her. And uh, I think her and Travis make a pretty good couple. So, well, hey, you know what? Let's get them out to the Sporting KC game tonight. How about that? <laughs> I was going to say, like, now can, uh, can Patrick and Brittany maybe – Bring them into some soccer. That would be uh, pretty amazing. Yeah. How about the launch of the new stadium for the current would be a great event to be able to get that kind of pub, right? You know, hey, if the NWSL wants to, you know, really spin some dough and may, I don't know if they, I don't know what this would cost, but like have something <laughs> similar to what, um, you know, Carrie Underwood singing Sunday night, you know, waiting all day for it. Like yeah. you could have a song equivalent for the premium NWSL match every weekend and have Taylor sing the intro. There you go. And film it See? at Casey Current Stadium. You and I are solving problems that the world needs to have solved right here on the Aftershock. Uh, yes. Well, let's talk about playoff soccer because tonight is, you know, some people would say it's playoffs. Some people say, no, it's the playing game or the wild card game or whatever. And, you know, but listen, both teams have been through enough this season given the parity of the Western Conference, to deserve at least an opportunity to play this game tonight. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the advantage to Sporting Kansas City being at home, the earthquakes came in there in 2020. Tamelia was just incredible, stopping, my recollection is stopping three straight penalties, basically, uh, to, uh, to basically make the, the, uh, the, the, the shootout you know, into a, a non-story. Um, because, uh, you know, Sporting Kansas City just just shut the door very quickly on the Earthquakes playoff hopes after Chris Wondolowski scored a goal to send it into that extra time to begin with. So that was an amazing game. Um, and, uh, of course, good from a Sporting Kansas City side to get that win. Coming tonight, Tim Melia still in goal. The Earthquakes with their own, one of the best shot stoppers in MLS this season, if not the best, Danielle so you've got two really excellent goalkeepers where if this comes down to penalties, you could see it go either way. Um, but in both of these teams, last time, uh, you know, the earth, the earthquakes came to Children's Mercy, lost 3-0 when Sporting Kansas City came to PayPal Park. Also, you know, a 3-0 game. Um, we're predicting a bit of a tighter game tonight, I would, I would think. You know, what is your outlook for the game itself? You know, who's healthy? Who's maybe questionable? There seems to be some stuff going around injury reports uh, from Peter Vermes this mm -hmm. week as well and kind of his comments about availability. Yeah, we've seen a few players uh, for Sporting Kansas City, key players, I might add, pop up on the uh, injury report um, in, in mostly questionable capacities. Uh, we, I was out at training the other day, and every guy trained in some way, shape, or form. So it wasn't that um, – you know, anyone's been out of training, at least as of yesterday, match day minus one. Um, so that's good news for Sporting Kansas City. Johnny Russell spoke with the media yesterday as well. He's a player that's dealing, uh, you know, with a knock and was on that injury report. And he said, look, it's, it's going to take a lot to keep me <laughs> out of this game. He's a warrior uh, that's been well documented over his time with Sporting Kansas City, especially last season when the team was dealing with a number of pretty significant injuries. They didn't have two of their three DPs and Alan Polito and Gotti Kinda. Johnny Russell really shouldered uh, a lot of the responsibility and played through uh, a lot of discomfort uh, to just help the team the best that he could. Of course, sporting the sound of the playoffs that year um, and this year having those players back and healthy has been good. Um, I think I, I'm with you. I think it's going to be a tight game. I, I think it's going to come down to a couple of things. Number one, San Jose's wing play is so dangerous, but I'd also – say that sporting has gotten a lot stronger in their two wingback positions with the additions of 
Logan and Dembe and Jake Davis. Both of them have the physical skills for those positions and to manage players like a Christian Espinoza, for example. But they've now in recent weeks, because they're both young, they're both under 22 guys, not in both designation. Logan and Dembe is an under 22 player. Jake Davis is a homegrown player. Um, they've also started to really from a just kind of the mental side of the game, cross clear some hurdles that I think limited them uh, in earlier games and stages of their career with Sporting Kansas City. So I'd say defensively, this team is playing the best soccer that it's played all season long. And it's a pretty good time for that to be the case because I'd say that the biggest Achilles for this team, even when they started to turn it around, because goal scoring was an issue to start the season. And when you don't have goal scoring and your defense is a little shaky, it's just not a good combination in this league. So then the goal scoring starts to turn around. When you get on Polito back, you start to get more dangerous pieces centrally uh, into the mix, which I think was a big limitation for sporting early in the season. They just didn't have as much of that hey, you got to watch this guy coming up the middle because then it just made it really one-dimensional for sporting. You shut down the wings, you shut down their entire attack. So getting those players back and healthy, getting the Politos, getting the Gotti Kindas uh, back in those dangerous central midfield positions, Nemanja Radoya, uh, who is the defensive midfielder for sporting Kansas City, he was kind of in and out of the lineup when he first came over. He's been a huge key for this team because the way sporting like to play, having a just consistent, can cover ground, get stuck in, distribute the ball, holding midfielder just opens things up for the the two uh, higher, you know, more attacking uh, central midfielders. So that's when the goal started to really kind of hit the back of the net for Sporting Kansas City. But you were still seeing the defense a little shaky at times, not fully locked in, giving up set piece goals. And now they're starting to kind of turn that around and you're you're seeing more consistent performances from this group and i thought how sporting's back line played against minnesota outside of the set piece goal which was just a little poor defending um i think has given at least myself and how i assess this team a lot more confidence that they can handle um the attacking threats that san jose do have in this game but the way that offensively the sporting team has been clicking recently and Minnesota I don't think tactically set themselves up to have the best uh, success you know they kind of let Johnny Russell get isolated one-on-one -on, -one on the wings a little too often Daniel Shallowy was having his way with Zarek Valentin um, but regardless I think this team has just more dangerous options going forward that makes it hard for opposing teams to know who they need to divvy up their focus on. Because if you don't shut down the wings, Daniel or Johnny can cut in and fire off a shot of their own. If you leave Polito open and try to, you know, put a lot of focus on cutting off the wing distribution, he's going to drift to either side and, and get the ball in tight spaces. He can open things up to get a shot off himself or dish it off to Eric Tommy. So there, there's just a lot of, uh, a lot of continuity with this with this attack, but I think the goalkeeping is going to be a big thing in this game as well. But it's playoffs, you know, anything can happen, oh, yeah. and, and it's going to yeah. be, you know, these Sporting's done really well this season in getting on the board early. They have scored, um, I believe, the most thirty their thirty first half goals this season are the most in the Western Conference. So that goals change games, as we know. So like you get on the board right. early, and that changes how the other team has to come out and manage the rest of the game. Playoff games are a little different, right? You you want to you got to go out and win, but at the same time, you don't want to do too much too early, get too aggressive, and then leave yourself exposed. And the San Jose team is really dangerous on the counter, and so I'm curious how Sporting will strike that balance between being aggressive, going to goal, trying to to change this game early with a goal or two versus okay, well if we get too high up the field, if we're going forward and then we get turned over can we recover quickly enough or how do we ensure that we don't leave San Jose in a position where they can, can really hurt us. And so I, I'm really curious to see how that aspect of the game plays out. But I also think too, you know, the other thing I'll say with sporting Kansas city in my time covering the team, they of course missed out on the postseason last year and in 2019, but in 2018, 2020 and 2021, this team was a top three seed going into the playoffs. And they had disappointing exits on their home field all three of those seasons. And 
I am really curious to see what this team as maybe a bit more of an underdog and playing with house money a little bit. San Jose, I know in a similar spot because you're playing the wild card game. You're a lower seeded team. I really think that it could bring something out of this, this group that they've been missing the last few years. And a lot of those guys that were on those higher seeded teams on those, you know, favorites to win teams that lost at home. A lot of them remember how bad that felt. And a lot of them are still on this team. And I'm, I'm really interested to see what level they're unable to unlock within themselves to try to take this thing as far as they possibly can, but it all starts tonight. Well, it's going to be exciting. Uh, the game starts at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time, 8.30 uh, p.m. Central time. That feels like a very late start. Is, is late that, one. That's going yeah. to be uh, kind of interesting to have a little bit, maybe extra afternoon coffee to be ready for that one. Oh, yeah. I'll get a coffee on my way to the game. So <laughs> and hopefully no rain delays because that would not be that would not be bueno. Well, the great thing about radio and playoffs is they still need you. It's not like, you know, in the days where you had the television broadcast and then you yield it over to a, a national uh, yeah. you know, crew or something like that for playoffs. You get to actually keep calling games as long as they stay in. So I'm sure you're yeah. quite excited about that. So have a good call tonight, Allie. And uh, it was really great to have you on uh, something. that's kind of a little bit almost like a bucket list for me in terms of people I wanted to have on the show. To have to have you on, and so I was really excited to, to that we could connect and make it happen. Me too. It's been so great coming on and chatting with you, and thanks for thinking of having me on. I'm so excited for tonight, and uh, hope for a really really great game. But I, hope I know for some, hope for some good weather too. <laughs> mostly the weather, mostly the weather, and then the game will follow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, great to talk to you today. Thanks for coming on the aftershock. We'll uh, hopefully get to talk to you again soon. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks so much. All right, take care, Allie. Bye.